Little Britches, Father and I Were Ranchers, by Ralph Moody. Chapter 16, A Good Mouth with No School. Freddie Sp Freddy Sprague got the mumps in late October, and they closed the school. That month was one of the best I ever had in some ways. It started off bad because Bill, our old white horse, died. Father let me go up, up to Bear Creek Canyon with him to get another load or of fence posts. We drove Bill and Nig, and while we were loading the poles, it started to rain and sleet. It didn't hurt Nig a bit, but from the time it started, Bill bumped his head up. I'm sorry, he humped his back up like a sick old cow. We had to stop and rest him so often that we didn't get home till long after dark. And that night he died, in spite of all the doctoring father could give him. Mother wouldn't let us quit studying because just because the schoolhouse was closed. So as soon as the supper dishes were washed, we had to get our books out. One evening, Fred and Bessie Autland came over to play whilst with father and mother before we had our arithmetic done. So they sat and talked till we got through using the table. Fred said, Oh, good sakes, Charlie. Don't you know me well enough to, to well enough yet to let me yin, lend you a horse? You could do me a favor by taking the three-year-old I brought at the auction and gently breaking him for, breaking him for me this winter. Fred, I couldn't expect a brother to do the things you've done already for me and my family. No, Fred. I can't take your colt. My record for losing horses must be the worst in the country, 50% in a year. Fred slapped his leg and laughed when father said that. Then he said, those nags were 90% dead when you, got them, when you got a hold of them. A man's just throwing his money away to buy that kind of plugs. <laughs> they ate just as much as good horses and you can't get any work out of them. I'll bring the colt down in the morning. Fred brought the big bay colt right after we got done eating breakfast the next morning. He was a beauty, but father wouldn't let me go near him at first. He tied him up at the far end of the barn and gave him two quarts of oats morning and night, while Nig and Fanny only got peas, vines, peas, vines and all. The day after we got the new horse, father and I went to Fort Logan with the box wagon. Fanny took Bill's place, but she didn't like it a bit. I guess she had forgotten all she had learned in the spring about working double. She slammed and banged around and threw herself down a couple of times before she decided she was going to have to do it. And all the way down to the fort, she danced and pranced like a two-year-old. <laughs> we did our trading with Mr. Green in Logan Town. He had the only general store, but there were nine saloons and a post office besides the depot. Father had brought a couple of little bags to show Mr. Green. One was beans and the other was peas. There were quite a lot of little beans among them because they didn't get water enough when they needed it. And some of them were kind of black where the frost had hit them before they were ripe. Mr. Green looked both samples over and said he didn't think he could handle many of the peas, but he'd take all the beans he had, we had, in trade if they were hand-picked so that we only brought him the full-sized white ones. Mr. Green and Father talked a little while, a little time, while I looked, while I was looking around the store at all the things I hoped we would be able to trade for our beans for. Then Mr. Green went into his back room and rolled out three empty barrels. While he was gone to roll out the barrels of, of flour, I smelled of the empty ones. Two of them had a vinegar in the, had vinegar in them and the other one molasses. I ran my finger in through the bug hole, bug, bung hole of the molasses barrel and there was still some in there. It tasted good. You never saw so many groceries we had down. You never saw so many groceries we, we got that day. Besides the barrel of flour, there were 100 pound sacks of cornmeal, sugar and salt, 10 pounds of seeded raisins and cream of tartar, rice, soda, and saltpeter, and a pound of baker's chocolate. It seemed we had we we would have we would have enough stuff 
to keep us fed, even if winter lasted clear till June. That night after supper, father and mother talked about peas and beans and did arithmetic problems with, uh, on the other side of the table from where Grace and I were doing our homework. Father was telling mother how many square feet of ground he pulled the beans, bean vines from to get the sample for Mr. Green. And the same thing about the peas. First, she borrowed Grace's arithmetic book to find out how many square feet in an acre. And after that, she got her marked cup and measured each sample. Then she figured and figured and figured. When she was all done, I could tell that both she and father were the happiest they had been since we came to the ranch. She had all the answers down on one sheet of paper and said, Charlie, we're going to be a lot better off than I thought we could, than I thought we could be when I saw the leaves on those poor plants curling up in the summer. If I didn't, if I didn't make any mistakes in my figures, and I'm sure I didn't, we'll have 160 bushels of beans and 180 bushels of peas. Supposing that 30 bushels of beans are small ones, which will only bring four cents a pound, and that 30 bushels are frosted and will only be good for pig food, that would leave us 100 bushels of good ones. At five cents a pound, our share will be worth $186. That is, if there are plenty pounds in a bushel. I meant if there are 60 pounds in a bushel. You know, practically all the peas of the variety we, we have are used for soup, so it doesn't make a particular different, a, so it doesn't make a particle of difference if some of them are small. They should all bring the same price. Let's say that will be four cents a pound. One half should bring in $192. I can't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to afford a good horse like Fred Altland's. Right after breakfast the next morning, father hooked Fanny to the buckboard and mother took all the other youngsters to Inglewood to buy stockings and underwear and things. I had a day's work helping Bessie Altland pick apples, so I left before they did. We picked bushels and bushels of apples, and when Bessie took me home, just before supper, she helped me put two bushel basketfuls, two bushel basketfuls of the buck on the buckboard after I'm sorry. She helped me put two bushel basketfuls on the buckboard for us. As we came near our house, I could see what looked like three big white sacks of grain hanging from a crossbar at the back of our barn. I jumped off while the bays were making their circle in our yard and ran around the barn. Our three biggest pigs were hanging, were hanging their dead with all the hair scraped off them. It kind of started me at, startled me at first, and I guess father noticed it. He came right over and bent down on one knee beside one. Then he put his arm around my shoulder and said, there isn't a thing to be afraid of or to be or to feel bad about, son. The only time to feel sorry for anything or anybody that dies is when they haven't completed their mission here on earth. These pigs' mission was to get big and fat so as to make food for us. They've done a good job of it and their mission is completed. And I do want you to know this. They didn't know what happened and they weren't hurt at all. They didn't even squeal. Father could always explain things like that, so I understood. Everybody worked on the pork the, day, the next day. Father cut the hams and bacon and side meat while Philip and I stripped all the fat off the insides and ground up the scraps of, for sausage. Father made a separate pile of the leanest scraps and we ground them for mincemeat. Mother and the girls were just as busy in the kitchen as they were outside as we were outside. They rolled all the sausage into little cakes, little cakes the size of a turkey egg, fried them slow, and packed them away in a stone crock, in stone crocks, tried out all the lard, and made the lead, made the livers and the hearts into sausage. Then they chopped apples and made the mincemeat. It was stewing on the back of the stove when we came in to supper. I never heard of making mincemeat with pork before, 
but it smelled and tasted better than any other I ever had. We got a lot of things done that month when school was closed. We were the only people anywhere around who didn't have a corral and a dugout cellar. Mother had been worrying ever since that big win because we didn't have a storm cellar, and Father had been saying he'd build one as soon as he had, he had time to get to the mountains for poles. <clears throat> I couldn't figure out why we needed poles to build a cellar, but I didn't like to ask Father. On things like that, he always used to tell me I could learn more if I kept my eyes open and my mouth closed. <laughs> Mother just... Mother must have mentioned something about wishing we had a cellar half a dozen times while we were packing the barrels of pork away in my room in the bunkhouse. At, break, at breakfast the next morning, Father winked at me and said, Do you think we could spare time to go up the canyon for a load of poles today? Of course I did think so, and right after breakfast we started putting Bill's harness on the new colt. Then... He sent me up to Autlands on Fanny and said to tell Fred we'd like to borrow one to fit her. I was so excited about going to the mountains with Father that I didn't think much about what we were going to do with three harnesses. But Fred did. As soon as I told him what I wanted and where we were going, he stretched his head and said, Has your old man gone loco? If he thinks he's going to harness that green colt and take him up to the mountains along with Wright's old mare, He'd, he, he's either the bravest man I've ever seen or a damn fool. I told him father was the bravest man he'd ever seen and wasn't any fool, so he let me have the harness. <laughs> I had to walk Fanny all the way home because the harness slapped around so much when I made her canter. All the way, I kept thinking about what Fred said. I was kind of scared, too, about what the what, what about what would happen when father got all three horses hooked up to the wagon. When I got there, he already had Bill's harness on. I'm sorry, Bill's harness on the coat, colt. But he had it fastened on with three or four extra straps, and the traces were tied up around the back of, it, of the breeching. The coat was sweaty and nervous, but he wasn't raising Ned like a, he wasn't raising Ned at all. After Father had hooked Nig and Fanny to the box wagon, and Fanny had gotten over slatting around, had got over slatting around, he led the colt out and tied him up close to the back of it. He hitched his head to both sides so that he had to keep it right in the middle of the tailgate. Then I ran to the house for our dinner pail, and we started off. You never saw a horse bulk and kick so much worse than that colt did when he felt the harness flopping around him, but father had it strapped on so tight and his head tied up so short that he couldn't hurt anything. By the time he went past Altland's house, he was soaking wet, but he wasn't bucking anymore, just dragging back on the, halters, on the halter rope and trying to spit out the bit. Fred was standing out in the yard when, he went past, when we went past. When I waved to him, he waved back and yelled, I'll take back what I said, Spikes. I just grinned because I knew all the time that whatever Father did would be right. Father must have guessed what Fred had said because I didn't tell him, but he looked over at me and grinned too. When we had loaded our poles and got down out of the canyon, Father tied the colt alongside of Nig. That time he fastened a strap from, colts, from the colt's outside trace over into Nig's breaching one so that he couldn't swing his hind he couldn't swing his hind end around sideways at first he'd hang back till the single tree bumped against his legs then he'd jump around the kick but nig didn't care and then he learned to stay in where he belonged <laughs> father unhitched fanny after we got home and while he still had the load piles on the wag on the wagon he hooked the colt in her place by that time, he was used to the harness, and I guess he was a little tired, but he hardly made a bobble. In half an hour, he was pulling like an old horse. We hauled poles for three days and took the colt with us every day. After the first one, Father put him in Fanny's place just as soon as we got down out of the canyon, and from then on, 
he behaved better than Fanny did. Before we started hauling poles, f poles, Father had dug a little ditch around a patch of ground in the backyard. He made a trowel that ran out there from the well, and every morning and night, it was my job to jump the ditch full of water. In three days, the ground had softened up in good shape, so we borrowed Carl's, Carl's Carl Henry's slip scraper and started digging our cellar. He had learned how to ease a horse up into the, the collar for a hard pull while we were staying hay, while we were stacking hay. Father hitched Nig and the new colt to the scrapper, the scraper that is, and let him drive them while he let me drive them while he held the handles. If I didn't start the team real easy when father raised the handles of the scraper, the cutting edge might catch and throw him up under the horse's heels. Father explained it to me before he started and I was so afraid I might do something wrong and get him badly hurt that my hands were shaking when I reached out to take the lines. He wouldn't let me take hold of them then. He said I'd have to stop a little while he, I'm sorry, I'd have to stop a little while and get my mind straightened out because a horse could tell through the feel of the rain if the person driving him was afraid. Then he told me I had already proved I could make a horse do what I wanted to do what I wanted it to do. So there was no reason to be afraid, to be afraid now. <laughs> it made me proud to hear him say that. And when I reached out for the lines again, my hands were steady. I wrapped the reins around them and called, get up, get up. And with my voice as deep in my throat as I could make it go, get up. We scraped out a hole nearly as big as our kitchen while father dug the corners out, out square with a pitch and a shovel, I peeled bark off the poles with my draw knife. It took five days to build the cellar. After the hole was dug, we cribbed the walls up with poles like a long house, like a log house. We made the end walls half round at the tops and laid them and then laid poles across to make the roof grace and I stuffed all the cracks on the outside of the walls and roof with straw while father made the door and the steps. Then we hitched up the horses and with the scraper at the end of a long rope, filled dirt in tight around the sides and over the roof till it looked like a little hill with a trap door in it. The next week I peeled poles while father built them into a corral. It was a good one with a six pole fence, six feet high. Father set a big high post from the gate to swing on. Then he made the gate out of a slim, out of slim poles with the butt ends toward the hinges and a guy wire running from top of the post to the lighter end of the gate so it could never sag. While we were building it, I think I got thinking how lonesome our little house had looked to me, sitting out there on the prairie, when I had first seen it from the hill by Fort Logan. When the last nail was driven and the hasp was put, in the, put on the gate, I got father to let me put Nig and the new colt and our two cows in the corral. Then he let me take Fanny and ride up to the hill, to that hill again, so I could look at the place, look at our place, and see how much it looked like a real ranch now. The end of chapter 16.